In two of my previous videos, I wanted to see whether I could get Windows NT4 and Windows 2000 on the modern internet. And in both cases, there was reasonable success. The next logical step was, can I go further back in time and get that almost forgotten operating system, Windows NT 3.51 on the internet? It did support TCP IP, which is all we need to get testing. Let's dig into perhaps one of the most forgotten moments in Microsoft's operating system history. Windows NT 3.51 on the modern internet. In Windows NT 3.51, networking wasn't discovered automatically. There was no plug and play. That means manually specifying IRQs and IO addresses. Windows NT expected you to know your hardware configuration. Here I opened the configuration for the network adapter, a 3Com Etherlink 2. Its settings are entered explicitly, IRQ3 and an IO address at hex 300. These values would have matched the settings configured in the BIOS or on jumpers. Inside 86 box, my emulator, the same process applies. Under the network card's configuration, the IRQ and IO address are set manually. These values must mirror what was defined in Windows NT. The ability to mimic exact hardware is the reason I chose 86 box for this virtualization. Back in Windows NT, the adapter configuration is closed and the TCP IP protocol is selected. From here, the DNS settings are entered manually. I use Google's public DNS servers 8.8.8.8 because old habits die hard and I've been using them for years when I need a quick and easy public DNS. To test the configuration, I open main program manager and then command prompt. IPconfig confirms that we have an IP address from the slurp configuration in 86 box. The ping to Google's DNS servers confirms internet connectivity and a request to youtube.com returning a reply shows that DNS recursive lookup is working. I then turn to an aspect of the internet that's almost forgotten today, the news group. These discussion forums were distributed globally via Usenet, a decentralized system that predated the web where messages were replicated from server to server rather than hosted in a single place. In the early part of my career, this was one of the places I used to go to for technical support and to try and find solutions to problems I had with Windows. I'm using Outlook Express here and I go into the news group account settings. Server in use here is Eternal September, accessible at news.eternal-september.org. This is a free service that enables you to plug yourself back into the entire Usenet group infrastructure, approximately 8,000 groups. 1994, nearly every ISP would have provided access to news groups. Eternal September is connected at gigabit speed to multiple internet backbones and integrated into Usenet through more than 40 peers. It's a system that allows our Windows NT workstation to participate in part of the internet that never entirely disappeared. Access to newsgroups was using the NNTP protocol over port 119. There was no encryption, everything was sent in clear text. As I open the newsgroup section, it prompts me to look at the subscription list from the server. What was interesting is that as you type in a word such as travel, you have to wait for it to propagate and fill all of the list on the screen. There was no progress indication, so often people would click things thinking it wasn't working, but this is how it worked. Once the list is filled, I can click on travel and then subscribe. Back in the news groups viewer, Outlook Express begins to populate with messages. Among them are posts dated 2025. I was quite surprised to see that people are still actively engaging with such an old technology. I went back to the subscription list to see if I could find a computer-based news group. I chose alt.comp.os.windows-xp, but there's not a lot going on here. In 2025, only three posts are visible, all from the same author. Usenet might still exist, but all of the subscribers and likes have moved on to YouTube. Is it possible to stream video on Windows NT 3.51? Certainly video streaming did exist in 1994, but before I can test anything, I'm going to need to add a sound card. And to do that, I'm going to choose the classic Sound Blaster 16, which is a simple installation for Windows NT. As I did with the network card, I need to explicitly configure the hardware settings for the sound card. The Sound Blaster 16 is configured to use IRQ5 with a fixed IO address at hex 220. I've disabled the MPU-401 MIDI interface as its IO address conflicted with other hardware, which I'll show you in a few moments. In the configuration of 86 box, you can see the problem of the conflict. The Sound Blaster's MPU-401 MIDI interface is mapped to hex 300 IO address. That address is already in use by the Adaptex SCSI controller. On period hardware like this, an overlapping I.O. range won't be resolved automatically. If two devices attempt to use the same address space, one of them is going to fail. When I tested it, it was the SCSI card, so NT wouldn't boot. With the sound card now working, RealPlayer is opened. Under the Help menu, the About screen confirms the version in use, RealPlayer 5.0 build 0.97. This is the 32-bit release. 
which has a mixture of the Windows NT 3.51 aesthetic and Windows 95 at the same time. I've chosen it because it is a version that can stream video. On my MacBook Air, I use FFmpeg to convert shot16.mp4 into a real player format. This uses a lower bitrate of 60K and 120K for the buffer size. In real player, I open the location of the RM file which I've hosted on my Mac using a Python HTTP server. Real player tries to buffer and stream the file, but unfortunately it causes the application to crash. I'm pretty sure this is because I'm trying to stream audio and video at the same time. Undeterred, I took a video I'd made of a compact BIOS, no sound, only video. I converted this using FFmpeg and tried to stream it. A little time is taken for buffering, but it is successful and the video plays. The resolution, however, is so low that watching becomes pointless. I went on to try various updates to RealPlayer, including version 6, 7 and 8. However, none of them were able to successfully stream video and audio that I'd converted from an MP4 format. In a previous video, you may have seen me pull down email from Gmail on Windows NT4. So I thought, can I do it in NT3.51? I picked Eudora Lite as this was a very common email client of the time. And immediately I've run into a snag. There's no option to specify the POP3 server you want to get your mail from. Instead, Eudora derives it from the email address itself. The domain portion, the part after the at symbol, gmail.com in this case, is used to locate the mail server via DNS. And of course, this is a system that has long since disappeared and it's not going to work. But I have a plan to fool Eudora into thinking it's talking to Gmail. I had a static entry to the Windows host file to resolve gmail.com to my Mac's IP address. And as in the previous video, my Mac is running Stunnel, which Eudora connects to, believing it's talking to the Gmail pop servers, while the encrypted connection to the real Gmail is handled by Stunnel. I ask Eudora to check mail and initiate the connection, requiring my app-specific Gmail password. And the connection is successful. Eudora connects to the Mac, the Mac connects to Gmail, and we download the emails. Opening a message from Substack reveals the raw headers first, exactly as they arrive from the server. The body follows in plain text, rendered as best it can be. Eudora Lite predates rich HTML email, so this is the program's best attempt to display the email. Opening a second message from Substack makes the limitation even clearer. Modern HTML content can't be displayed correctly in a client of this age, so as you can see, a lot of garbled characters appear on screen. FTP was super popular in the early 90s if you wanted to shift a big file. This was the tool you were going to use. For a test, I'm going to open WS underscore FTP, but I'm going to do it via File Manager because when you install it, it doesn't put any shortcuts into Program Manager. The software was written by John A. Junod, a decorated US Army Master Sergeant who developed the original application in 1993. Mr. Junod originally released it as shareware and then in 1996 he retired from the army, sold the rights and joined the company that bought them. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that WSFTP is owned by Progress Software and is used by more than 40 million people worldwide. It's still a completely relevant piece of software. Now it's time to try a connection to an open FTP server at ftp.gnu.org. The connection went through so we know basic FTP is working. However, an error appears in the corner of the screen. It's quite a subtle failure, but the error message gives the clue that something isn't quite right. The connection was established, but it's not exchanging data as expected. Reviewing the old memory banks reminds me that this is probably using active FTP, which expects me to have a dial-up connection and a publicly accessible IP address. And of course, this is inside a NATed virtual machine that's beyond my own home firewall. Once we connect with passive FTP, you can see the correct response codes in the bottom left-hand corner of the program. For the first test, I download the robots.txt file and open that with Notepad. And ironically, we see that the file contains the section that says no robots nor humans should ever visit this page. As I said at the start of this section, FTP was used to move large files around. Let's see what happens when we have video measuring 138 megabytes. The transfer proceeds without any issues. You can see the display showing you the length of time for it to download. I really liked these interfaces that showed you what was happening. It meant you felt more engaged with the whole process. I didn't dig too far into the world of FTP servers, but I'm pretty sure that you could fully operate FTP using Windows NT 3.51 like you do today. Based around the POP3 protocol, Eudora Lite did pretty well with the email. If it had features for SMTP authentication, I believe it could have sent mail as well as received it. Newsgroups appeared and operated 
almost exactly like they did in 1994. And that took me right back to the very beginning of my career and dipping my toe into the myriad of news groups on Usenet. If you watched any video online back in the mid to late 90s, RealPlayer was often the application that was used to stream live radio. And once I got my own MP4 into the correct format for RealPlayer, you can see that it streamed a modern recording. FTP, although created back in 1971, still holds its own and is still in use today, although it's been replaced with SFTP, which uses SSH for security. Windows NT 3.51 is a rather forgotten operating system, and that's a shame. It was early in my career. I was working in 1996, moving 3.11 for work groups over to 95, and 3.51 was found more in the corporate world. I do remember when I used to go down to the Halifax Building Society on New Street in Birmingham, that was the operating system they had on the front desk. If you've never used this, I thoroughly recommend getting 86 box out and putting together a virtual machine of your own. It's a lot of fun to have a look around something that's near 31 years old. And if you're interested in how to do that, I'll be publishing a Substack article to show you how I did it. As ever, I really appreciate all the subs, likes and comments. Keep them coming. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Ta-da!